the stage this amazing young man. He is an actor whose roles include that magic show, <laughs> the vampire show, and recently the movie with the insect inspired superhero that is not the Marvel guy. He's a convention buddy of mine, and please, for the next 45 minutes, he'll be yours as well. Welcome, Harvey Dean! Hi, everyone. Howdy, y'all. Woo! Austin, let me hear you make some noise! That was cool. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. It's hot out here, Austin. <laughs> Very hot. I wanted to, you know, dress up like a little bit country, a little bit goth. <laughs> so I uh, did not take the 104 degree into consideration. <laughs> But it's nice and cool in here, so we can all relax together. I know. I, uh, I'm from Florida, so uh, the dry heat's fine with me. It's the humi lack of humidity. It's, okay. Yeah, the LA, I'm okay with the heat. It's just this, it's, it's humidity, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, today the temperature will be, ah. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so there's some constraints of what we could talk about, but one thing we can, I've heard this story, but I would love you to share it with, with our audience. Uh, let's go to your origin story. Uh, what, um, what propelled you to pursue acting? The origin story. Yes. Uh, well, I want to be an Secret actor. origin. Yeah. <laughs> Super secret. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but maybe it's the first time you've heard it. So uh, my origin story, I wanted to be an actor when I was about six years old. I was at home on Christmas break, and I was watching TV. And I thought I was watching this brand new show, and it was Annie, the movie. <laughs> and I wanted to just be that so badly. These kids were singing and dancing. I fell in love with it. Like, I was like, what is this new show? It's kind of long, but <laughs> it's a lot of episodes. It must be a marathon or something. Uh, it's called a movie, Harvey. It's called a movie. Uh, we didn't go to the theater, so I didn't know what that was really. Like, we didn't, I didn't know the difference. This is how, uh, you know, little and innocent I was. And I wanted to do that so badly. I fell in love with acting that way. And I remember looking at my mom and saying to my mom, Mom, I want to be that. When I grow up, I want to be an orphan. <laughs> And she looked at me and she's like, ¿Qué? ¿Estás loco? <laughs> so are you crazy? And I was like, I want to be an orphan. She's like, oh, no, son actores. They're actors. And I was like, ah, I want to be an actor. And she's like, no, mijo, no tenemos dinero. We don't have money. <laughs> and I was like, you got to have money to play poor on television? Like, it didn't make sense to me. I was like, why do I need money to play poor on television? These kids, like, you know, were singing and dancing and making the best out of it. And I was like, they look like us on a Sunday morning, cleaning the tub. Like, you know, it's just like, we do that for free at home. I'm doing it right now. And she was like, no, those kids take acting classes and, and dance classes and vocal lessons, and we don't have money for that. And I was like, well, you know, that really disappointed me. And I was like, I guess I can't do it. It's not for me. It's for rich kids. And then she saw how sad that made me. And she goes like, Miko, I didn't say you couldn't do it. I said, I don't have the money to provide you the tools, but you can do anything you want to do. And that really like resonated with me because I was so young. And I was like, yeah, I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> Can you make me chicken nuggies? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, a fellow thespian at school, uh, we were <laughs> determined to be on Disney Channel, and one day she came up to me, she's like, did you hear they're doing um, improv class at the community center? And I was like, what is that? It's where people go and they discover Disney kids. <laughs> and I was like, that's what improv means? <laughs> And he's like, mm hmm it's a class. And they just come and they go, boop, boop, and they pick you from that class. And I was like, well, I have to go on this class. I didn't know what it was, but I have to do it. And she's like, yeah, it's super easy. It's $12.50. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then she went to her mom and got a 20 and let her keep the change. I went to my mom. She goes, mijo, no tenemos dinero. I'm like, we don't have money for that. We need that for laundry. We need that for you know groceries. We need it for everything. And I was like, so I was disappointed again. And then I was like, OK, how am I going to get 
this money, you know? So I was walking home from school with, one day with her, and we're walking through a park, and there was this homeless man going through a trash can. And I was like, Mom, what is he doing that's so gross and sticky? And she's all, oh, vende los botes. He sells the cans. And I was like, you make money from trash? And I ran into her closet, got a wire hanger, unhooked it into a long finger, went into the kitchen, got a food for less plastic bag underneath the sink, and I went through trash cans, and I collected enough money to pay for my first improv class. Yeah. So she was right. You can do anything, you know? And I took the class, and it was like, they divided the kids, and it was like between like the ages of like six to like eight or nine, and, and then the kid, the older kids, like they 10 to like 14, were doing something like, you know, like improv heavy, you know, like real characters developed. And the younger kids were like, you're a, you're a lion. Walk around like a lion. And we're like, I'm a lion. And it's like, now you're a giraffe. Walk around like a giraffe. I'm a giraffe. And after the hour and a half, like everyone was laughing. I was making these like choices, because I didn't know what I was doing. But I just remember feeling this like crackle to this instant rapport with an audience that I was like, I really like this. And then at the end of class, of course, they were like, okay, everyone, great class. Remember to tell your parents about the next one. Sign up now. You know, sign up now. So you could also take the payment now. And we're like, mm. and I was like, it took me like four weeks to like raise the money for this one class. And I was like, do I want to go through trash cans again? It was disgusting and filthy and dirty. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I just kept doing it. And I kept, like, you know, getting loose end jobs, paying for, like, little classes here and there. And then all the way through high school, I worked through, like, Food for Less. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Pay Less, uh, Burger King. Uh, I worked at a restaurant. Like, I was just like, Food for Less was the store near our house where you can sell your cans and <laughs> get money. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, in the store, they have, like, a place in the back. I don't know if they have it in Texas, but in California, they have a recycling center. Like, usually at a grocery store, in the back, there's, like, a... A, a, some kind of like metal tin uh, truck that like weighs your <laughs> cans and they give you a little paper and they're like, here you go, go inside and you go to the store and that's kind of your voucher. And like, here you go, $4.92. And you get your money that way. Uh, so I did that for a while. Then I moved on to selling chocolates door to door with this like, corrupt like guy who was kind of evil. He went to like low income neighborhoods. We were very poor growing up and like he would go to low income neighborhoods and put up these like flyers. I won't even mention their name because I think there's actually might be still around. But it was like blank, blank, blank. Uh, we're looking for young. Are you a teen between the ages of 13 and 15 and looking for an after school job? And call us. And so like we help kids, blah, 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 achieve their dreams. And at this point when I called, I wasn't in my teens. I was like 11. But I've always been a boy of uh, thicker mass. And so... I convinced him that I was 13, so when I met this guy, I called him up. I don't know what my mom was thinking, like, let me call this stranger up. He showed up to my house in a van. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't know why my mom was like, well, at first she wanted to meet him. She's like, no, 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 lo quiero conocer. And I was like, oh, yeah, he's like, he works for, like, the company, mom. And I was like, que compañía? And it's like, no, it's a, it's a company for teens. And it's like, oh, okay, lo quiero conocer. And it's like, so he came in, did a whole spiel with my mom, and, like, was like, no, señora, look, we'll take care of him, blah, blah, blah. And so, like, and he took me aside. He's like, oh, you're 13 then. And I was like, yeah, yeah, 13. He's like, yeah, you look it, yeah. And I was like... Yeah, I look it. <laughs> and he would give you a box of chocolates, and he would, he's such a, a corrupt person. He would buy these boxes for 99 cents, and we'd sell them for $5, and he would give us $1.25 and keep the rest. And so we were just making him four times the money because he was using our appearance as kids, knocking doors. There was no organization. There was no blank, blank teens because it didn't exist. He just put flyers around the neighborhood, got a, a van, and filled it with kids. <laughs> In hindsight, my mother, my mother should have been more careful. <laughs> and there I went in her the, van. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the creepy guy in the van is like, you want some candy? Yeah, no, it's like, you get it. You, wa you want to sell some candy. Sell some candy. <laughs> yeah. That's different. You want some candy? Stay away from me. You want to sell some candy? Sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's sure. okay. Bye, Mom. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting, but I did become the best seller, <laughs> yes, which wasn't much because, you know, I wanted to just make money, so, like, he gives us $1.25, and then, you know, we go door to door, and you have a whole spiel, like, you're like, hi, my name's Harvey, and I'm with Blank Blank Teens, and I'm two boxes away from earning my trip to Six Flags, and they'd be like, oh, we're diabetic. 
And I was like, oh. And like, but, 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 here you go, $5. And then like, he weren't allowed to get tips. And this is where I knew he was corrupt because most of the people in the van were later teens, teens, which means they were later and they're like 14, 15, 16, and they've been to juvie and they had like tats. And I was looking around, I was like, wow, you guys have a lot of tattoos. <laughs> and they're like, what fool? You know, just like, <laughs> wow, you guys are really big. Like, I'm in the middle of these two, like, ginormous guys with, like, you know, wife tank tops and, like, shorts, like, totally choloed out with tattoos, and they're in their teens, and this is the only job they can get because they have a record. <laughs> and here I am, like, wow, and like, we're all working for the same organization. And he's like, I, he's like, I just need to get out of the house. You know, <laughs> it's like. I do improv. Do you do improv? Yeah, I do improv. Uh, why was my voice like that? <laughs> but that it was just like these, you know, they, he knew what he was doing. He was using these kids. They needed them. They needed him as much as he needed them, you know? But I didn't. I just wanted to raise that money. So I became his bestseller. And if you became his bestseller, you get to sit in the front of the van. And so, <laughs> so I was in the front of the van. And I was like, you know, pretending to be 13 when really like I was 11. And the other kids hated me <laughs> because they're like, why is he getting in the front of the van? And it's like, because he sold the most, okay? Jose, he sold the most. And I remember one time when I got to go with him early to pick up everyone, this is how like we didn't have like technology, no one could afford like to have a phone and stuff. So he would give us a piece of chalk and when you go into a street in residence, like residential areas, you put a chalk arrow going in with your initials. If there was no chalk arrow going out, you were in that street. So he would go down the street that he left you, arrow in, arrow out, arrow in, arrow out, arrow in, He's in here, and you go into that street, and, that, and you go looking, and then this would be hard at like 9 p.m. on a Tuesday night. So we'd be looking for kids sometimes that the rain would wash away their arrow, or their chalk dissolved, and they broke their chalk. So they just kept working street to street, and we'd be looking for them for like, one time I remember I was out till like midnight. Midnight, and I was like 11, and my mom, like I didn't have a cell phone, so I couldn't call her, and I got home, and I got yelled at. Like it was like, no, ya no vas a ir con él, ya no vas a ir con él. You're never going back with him. And I'm, I lied through my teeth. I was like, no, it's an organization. <laughs> And we're doing good work. And the worst part was I, he, I knew he was a criminal because we were like driving up to pick up some, somebody and we saw somebody get a tip. And since when you get a tip, he doesn't get a cut of that, right? He only makes money if you sell an item. So he always says, no tips. We don't take tips. You know, we're, or, we're, we're an organization, not a charity. You know? And I was like, that doesn't make sense. You know? And so uh, one time this guy got a tip and we saw him as we were picking him up. He got out of the van. He's like, I saw you take a tip. Give me the tip. He's like, man, I don't got tip. I don't got no tip. What are you talking about? I was like, no, give me the tip. Man, give, give me the tip. And he wrestled him to the floor. He like wrestled a teenager to the floor. And I was like, oh. and I was like, oh, I take tips sometimes. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then he gets in the car. He's like, can you believe that? He took a tip. And I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> and I was just like <laughs> putting my seatbelt on. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I can't believe he, he takes tips. We don't take tips. <laughs> And I was just like, oh my God, if he ever finds out. So now from that day on, when I would be like, oh, I'm, not, I'm diabetic, I'll give you a tip. Wait. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> it was terrifying. Uh, so to answer your question, my favorite color is blue. Okay, right. <laughs> Blue, right. Uh, that's the color uh, Nightwing wears, uh, which you do the voice for. We could talk about animation stuff. Yes. So, uh, uh, did everyone see the finale of that so far? No? Okay, good. Because <laughs> you might be surprised, or you might be shocked. Um, yeah, that's fun. I, I, when I got asked to do Nightwing, I uh, was really kind of surprised. I was like, really? Uh, most of the characters I end up playing have to be a higher pitch voice. So a lot of the characters I play are higher. I think the highest character is playing a, a house. <laughs> that would be the highest one. And then uh, a dog. And then I think uh, Nightwing is the lowest one I could play, I think, because it's, uh, it's always brooding. You know, it's like down here, and, it lives, and he has to be a little bit emo. But also he's like, I want to kill myself, you know? It's just like it goes like <laughs> really high and emotional, and it has to roller coaster. He's just dealing with a lot, you know? So it's really hard to play that. <laughs> it's cool. So uh, what's... Uh, uh, 
because it's, it, it's people on the outside think it's all the same thing, but on the inside, quite different. Uh, for for doing uh, voice acting and stuff, uh, what's your usual preparation? If I'm doing a day where I'm doing a high pitch voice, I have to wake up early and I always have like chamomile tea and I'll do some honey to coat my throat. Uh, I'll do some like warm up, so I'll get ready and I'll do like uh, like lip twirls, like a you know over and over until I start getting a little bit higher and so I go to you know, it goes higher and higher until I get a little bit higher and higher. It's just like a singer would do, you know, to warm up your voice. Uh, because sometimes those, it, it gets to the point where you can tell that you haven't warmed up. Uh, if it's early in the morning and I didn't warm up, I'm like, oh no, oh no, come on. Because those are the ones that are the, har the harder days. If I have like a higher pitch voice at the end of the day, after I've been talking all day or singing or you know, whatever in the car or whatever, it's better because the later in the day, the warmer your voice is. That's why a lot of concerts are at night, you know, because you have the whole day to warm up your voice and it's at top notch at, in the evening. But I hate when I do like a, oh, because I live in New York and I live in LA and back and forth. So sometimes I'll have to do like a, you know, LA time to New York time. So they're like, the producers in New York, so they want to do 12 noon. I'm like, oh, that's not bad for LA. No, it's 9 a.m for you, 12 for them. And I was like, oh, 12 in New York and nine for me. That's, that's cool. That's cool. I like, I like that. That's cool. And the worst is when you're traveling like abroad, like you can do voiceover from anywhere. So when I was living in Toronto, when I was shooting uh, that vampire show, <laughs> I, uh, I, I was shooting, you know, uh, the dog movie. <laughs> I can do animation, right? Yeah. I was doing Puss in Boots. Uh, and the hour difference was so different because we're ahead there. So then LA didn't want to get up early. So they were like, you know, oh, we'll do the session like at five in the afternoon, which is like seven or 8 p.m. Toronto time. Oh. <laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, you're also like waiting for the thing to happen and you're like waiting, waiting, waiting. So your energy is like, you know, you get tired at the end of the day. You're like, oh, you got to keep the energy up because by 8 p.m. you're like, oh, I have to still be, you know, this character. So you have like a Red Bull or something because <laughs> you have to be like so alert, you know, and over the top and like laughter. <laughs> so it's, it's different. And I think it's, people forget that for voiceover, you don't have your facial, physical, like tangible body to uh, portray this character and like show the roller coaster of emotions or laughter or whatever. You only have one tool and that's your voice. Like your voice has to convey sadness, happiness, uh, depression. You know, like think, I think of Perrito and like the juxtaposition of his storytelling being so upbeat and positive, but also telling the most sad, depressing story. Like, you know, like, you know, telling the story about the sock and the rock. And he's like, and they put me in the rock and they threw me in the, the river. <laughs> like that idea of like keeping an energy up with such a sad, that's all in your voice. Like you have to tell the story with your voice. You can't rely on facial expressions or body language. So if your voice doesn't deliver, it doesn't convey. So people wouldn't come and say, it really moved me when I couldn't feel what you were feeling in your voice. You know, it's like you really have to work a little bit harder. I've always said I always go home and sleep way harder when I do voiceover because it takes every muscle, like you have to control everything just with your voice and convey everything just perfectly because you don't get a second chance with like, oh, they'll get it because my eyes are going to be like, waka waka, you know, or my hand's going to be like, I'm going to grab the gun. You know, you don't rely on those things that we're so used to visual. It's all vocal, so it's a little bit harder, but I love it. So, yeah. People get it. I love to take people in the booth and putting the cans on, then leaving. And then I'm going to turn your microphone on, turn your cans on. And then they're like, oh, God, I can hear myself breathing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like, you literally hear the pin drop. Yeah, yeah. It's everything. It's, it picks up everything. Yeah. So it's Friday. What's a perfect day for you? A perfect day for me. Um, a perfect day for me would be waking up and being some, next to someone I love, uh, going to do what I love every day, and being surrounded with everyone that I love. So when everything that you love is within five feet away and it's tangible, uh, I'm the happiest. So like if I'm on set, and like my family visits me, or my sister, my brothers, my mom, uh, if I'm in a relationship, my partner's there with me, and I'm doing what I love, and everything is within tangible reach for me, I'm the happiest. That's a perfect day. Right on. <laughs> Well, my friend, like I said, I, uh, this, 
there's so many cool things I wish we could talk about because you, but you and your your peers on these projects doing some fantastic work. So I'll just say what I always say. I thank you. I thank you for your talents. I thank you for your professionalism. And I thank you for the performances you brought to all your roles. It's an absolute delight. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. So let's go ahead and take some questions for our audience. Let's go ahead and just start a line here. And whoever goes first, you'll get two pieces of candy. All right, you young lady. <laughs> okay, just remember the three rules, and I may periodically back you up and rephrase the questions so that everything's above board. Okay, what's your name? Aisha. Aisha, what do you want to know? Um, I want to know is how do you take care of your mental health, especially being in the Latin community? Because usually that's like the gugui for us. <laughs> So what was the last part? Kukui. Kukui. Yeah, I mean, I think mental health, yeah, does have a uh, stigma and taboo in the Latino community. Um, I think it's a product of, like, uh, the times that our parents and our grandparents grew up in. And I feel, and I pride myself and being an advocate for, like, you know, positive mental health. You know, I think everyone can uh, benefit from talking about their feelings. Um, I'm really lucky that I get to play a lot of characters that get to, like, go through an emotional roller coaster and, and show people, especially in the Latino community, like a certain character uh, who longs to be a vampire, um, <laughs> that uh, sometimes you need to be honest with yourself and and um, let people in. So the idea with that character specifically with mental health sometimes it's who you are, right? Like the person that you are meant to be, whether that be sexuality or in a professional world, uh, we're not honest with ourselves. When I think of it this way, when I think about in that character sense um, and in my personal life, like being queer, uh, you know who you are at a certain age and time and it might take you a while to share that with people and that kind of messes up with your mental health because you feel like you're keeping things from someone or that they won't accept you or love you or whatnot. So the mental health comes into play and how to like voice that. But when you tell someone of your desires or where you are, uh, you're not coming out, you're letting them in. So I always say I don't like the idea of coming out to people, you're letting them in because you already know who you were. You've already built a home for yourself. You already know what the windows look like, the furniture, you already built this home. You're letting the door open, you're letting someone in, and what they do when they come inside your home is what we fear, that they'll destroy it. They destroy the home that you've built. So we're very careful when we let people into our homes, right? And that can really mess with your psyche and your mental health. So I would caution everyone to not be fearful of opening the door, but also don't let just anyone into your home. Oh, thank you. Great question. All right. And hold on, because you got fangs, you get two red ones, obviously. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Monica. Monica, what do you want to know? So I've been listening to Brett Goldstein's Films to be Buried With podcast, and I was just curious, what would be a film that you would be buried with? Ooh, Ooh. that's a good one. Oh, man. So many good ones. Uh, I think that my go-to, I fell in love with like um, YA, like acting when I was in high school and I saw this film and it was Melly Linsky and Kate Winslet and Heavenly Creatures by Peter Jackson. And I love that so much. If I'm looking for the dramatic, right? Like I'm like, oh my God, the angst, the pressure, the queerness. <laughs> That I would bury me, but if I was looking for a comedy to go along with it and be buried, I'd probably say Waiting for Guffman. <laughs> yeah, probably those two. There you go, there you go. R.I.P. You, you and your ass face. I know. <laughs> you and your ass face. <laughs> Hey, what's your name? Uh, Rory. Rory, what are you doing? Hey, I was wondering since uh, Kayvon Novak couldn't be here today. He's uh, not? I know, I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. I figured I'd ask, uh, what's your favorite story of your friendship with him? Oh man, I love him. I really do. He's been such... Like, he's my best friend. Like, literally, he is... We've, we we lucked out that we have such really great chemistry together because I was supposed to do a chemistry read with Kayvon my, like, when I was asked to be on standby for the role because I was... Remember, I was too young for Guillermo. Guillermo was 20... I was too young for a familiar. Uh, sorry. 
that character. Um, I was too young for that character, and they wanted someone older because he had been a familiar for so long. And so I was the wild card. And when Hollywood, that's like, they, they're pretty sure they're not going to go with you, but they like what you did. So you're the wild card. We're going to be, you're going to be the backup plan. And nobody wants to be the backup plan, right? Nobody wants to be the side piece. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm wifey material. <laughs> And so I was like, okay. I mean, like, I guess it'd just be an honor to, uh, uh, you know, go in for them and like Taika and Jermaine and everyone. And so the, the I, I didn't get to go test with with him at all. And I was like, oh. and then they gave me the part. And they're like, why are we testing? And everyone voted unanimously to test this one actor. Just give it to him. And they did. And so I was so nervous on set. I was like, what if we don't have chemistry? What if we don't have chemistry? And man, from the first second when I saw him, he was like, hey man, I'm Kayvon. Nice to meet you. And I just knew. Like I was like, my friend, I have a friend here. I have a friend here. I have a friend here. And I just like, we just hit it off. And season one, like we had dinners and we go shopping. And even during the pandemic, when we were released out of quarantine and we can go shopping for groceries for ourselves, he's like, oh man, we'll go shopping. We gotta go shopping together. And we just got like shopping carts and went shopping together <laughs> through a grocery store in Toronto. And he like, you know, always checks in on me, checks in on my sister, checks in on like, he is like the nicest person. And I am so lucky to call him not only like the best coaster I ever have, but a best friend, you know? Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, what's your name? Finn. Finn, what do you want to know? Um, can I just ask like what it's like to be able to like inspire like a whole generation of like queer people with you and your characters? Well, that's very nice. Um, I didn't set out to, you know, um, inspire anyone. I set out to try to do what I always dreamt of doing. And since I never saw myself represented on screen, um, I fought even harder, you know, because if you don't see yourself represented, then become the first. And I pride myself in being the first for a lot of categories. And But that wasn't where I was setting my goals. I was setting my goal to do what I love. And if I do what I love every day, I'll be happy. And if I'm happy every day, if I inspire someone, they'll be happy. And if they do the same thing, it's a ripple effect, right? So me, by just existing and holding space and being me and loving what I do and, and showcasing and sharing my gift, which is the only thing I can do is entertain. And if that inspires somebody, then hopefully you inspire somebody. And it'll just be a ripple effect. And wouldn't it be great if we all just inspired each other? Cool. Thank you. Great question. Hi, what's your name? Uh, my name is Kayla, and uh, I wanted to know, so in Puss in Boots, there is a span of time where you're very bleeped out. What are you saying when you are bleeped out? <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, the director let me go just free, and I was like, what do you want me to say? And it, there was a couple of profanities, of course, but it was like, you're nothing but a motherfucker. You know, it was just like it went off, and it was off for a while, and some bad words I repeated because we ran out of words. And they're like, just do it again, yeah. And I was like in the booth with like, you know, I was like, how long is this going to be? And it's like, just do it again, Har Harvey, do it again. And I was like, okay, you mother... <laughs> and by the end, I was just like, did we get it? And they're like, no, keep going. And I was like... Um, and in the movie, it's really short, you know, but it feels like a long period, but it's pretty short. But um, they needed to say it because they needed to cut it off exactly where you hear the a diphthong of a bad word or a, uh, the cutoff of addiction of a certain word that you know exactly what I was saying. They'd be like, oh, I kind of heard what you said, even though we could get away with it because then you could show it in theaters and children can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Hi, what's your name? I'm Danae. Hi, Danae. What do you want to do? So do you have a favorite unscripted moment in TV or in voice acting, like something that wasn't supposed to be like that, but it just like organically happened? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to be on that vampire show <laughs> where I can do a lot of that, a lot of improvise. Um, you know, a lot of the one that people come up to me and they say they want me to write on like a Funko or something is like, you know, um, Gizmo, how are the dildos? Gizmo. <laughs> Get the dildos. Gizmo, try the dildos. Gizmo, how are the dildos? They're fine. That was, <laughs> that was never a line that was in the script. It was uh, Taika and Jermaine were being, in fact, if you see that, see that scene, it gets cut off right after I say, they're fine, and it cuts off because Jermaine laughs so loud. <laughs> and, like, they had to cut it off. 
<laughs> but it wasn't there, and it was it was like an improv scene that Jermaine and Taika were just like, yeah, just go. You know what you're saying? Like, what do they make you do? Like, you know, one of those is my favorite. We did a commercial with Kayvon, I think it was season two or something, where like uh, we're looking at resumes for uh, familiars, and he was like, ooh, a resume, and I was like, it's, it's resume, resume. <laughs> And he's like, oh, this one sounds like a rock star. And then he did a finger gesture that <laughs> instead of doing like a rock on like this, he did a different finger gesture. <laughs> and I was like, I lost it. And we had like eight minutes to get this commercial done. And then the, the director's like, we have eight minutes, guys, because we were shooting so long that month and we couldn't go over. And then he's like, came on. He's like, all right, man, right, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. He looks like a rock star. And then he did it again. And I was like, <laughs> So it's one of my favorite memories uh, to this day. Yeah. <laughs> Great one. Thank you. Hey, what's your name? Uh, Michael. Michael. Wait. Howdy, sir. Uh, I wanted to know what actors inspired you as you were going through your you know, journey to become an actor. That's a good one. Um, well, I grew up watching a lot of like Mexican television with my dad. Uh, we used to watch like Cantinflas. Uh, yeah, he's here for Cantinflas. Um, so I used to watch physical comedy through Cantinflas and like, and also Chespirito, like you know, uh, El Chavo del Ocho. Um, so I grew up watching with that kind of like farcical comedy that I fell in love with. So comedy is all about timing and setup. And so it really kind of is like a ballet, right? And so watching that, it was like watching a beautiful ballet of like perfect time to music and the music being the joke setup and rhythm and your body. And so I remember watching a lot of those and also watching a lot of like old classic films. My dad, you know, was at a different time. And so like he watched like Maria Felix and like we watched like, you know, all those black and white films. Um, but also in America, American culture, I was living two worlds, right? So I had American culture and I had Mexican culture, you know, in my uh, household at the same time. Then I also grew up watching, uh, we didn't really have cable, so I watched like reruns of I Love Lucy, like nonstop in her physical comedy and set up and well. So I was watching Intertwine, they're similar, different, but similar. Um, and then as I got older, you know, of course, like looking into like Meryl Streep, you know, like it's just like, oh my gosh, she's great in everything. Um, Sometimes, you know, just say, <laughs> no, she's great. But uh, but it was funny just to like see that I couldn't really find kind of like my inspiration. It wasn't like comedy wise, like sometimes watching like the George Lopez show, you know, would be like, oh, that's similar to my family and like similar with the, you know, humor and whatnot. So I was watching stuff, but I didn't find a lot of people who look like me on screen. So it was hard to kind of gravitate towards one. So I meshed them all together until it, it suited me and it felt like it was me. Yeah. All right on. Great question. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Great cosplay, by the way, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. What's your name? I'm Danny. Hi, Danny. Um, uh, I have a question for you, Harvey, but real quick. We have the same birthday, and I almost cried when I saw Aww. that. I was so excited. Aww. Happy late birthday. <laughs> hey, Taurus gang. Um, my question is, as a queer um, man of a thicker build, how does it feel to be a real deal heartthrob out here? <laughs> Um, that's very nice, thank you. Um, again, I never sought out to be a heartthrob. Very nice. Um, you know, for a long time you were told, and I was told by Hollywood standards that what I presented as a package was not welcome and was not desirable and it was not lovable. And so for you to say that, that means that the shift has happened in a way that makes me really happy because, yeah, it's happened uh, because it wasn't there 20 years ago, you know? I remember going to auditions and I've had teachers who were in school and were like, so what are you gonna do about the weight? And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, you could really be a leading man. I can, I can, yeah, and I will. It's like, no, you won't. And I was like, what? It's like, no one's going to put you on television. No one's going to put you in a show. No one's going to hire you in a commercial. No one's going to... I was hearing that all the things that were my strikes, always my strikes, your ethnicity, your queerness, your size, these were three that were always reminded to me that these were my strikes. These were never my strikes. These were my strengths. And it just took... 
it took Hollywood a second to realize it because now all of a sudden they're like, yes, yes, oh my God, yes, you looked amazing at the Met Gala. Oh my God, let's do a cover of a magazine. You look amazing. And it was like, hold up, you're the same people who like 10 years ago would like were considered, you know, to be fat phobic, to be, you know, like, so this, there's been a shift and it's up to all of us to show them there's people who love at any size and that those stories meant to be told because that's real life. We, we have bodies of every size who fall in love every day. Why is it that a cookie cutter molding is the only thing that we see as aspirational love in our lives? That's not true. Love who you fucking want to love. <laughs> Harvey, we've been looking forward to working with you for so long. Really? Hi. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and the other one, Gerda, hey, what's your name? Hi, my name is Gwen. Hey, um, hi, Harvey. I wanted to ask, um, you had been a judge on a drag competition show hosted by the Air Brothers. Um, I wanted to ask how it is as a queer performer judging other queer performers, especially when their art is, you know, drag, something different than what you do. That's a good question. Um, I always get weary about being a judge on those shows, and I've been on, you know, RuPaul's as well, uh, because I always think that as artists we should inspire each other, you know. So uh, it's being it's the difference between being critical and giving constructive criticism, you know, or your opinion. And your opinion can be taken with a grain of salt. So whenever I do those shows, which I love, I'm always kind of just blown. Most of the time, I'm just blown away by the artistry in front of me. So I rarely have a negative thing to say because. I can't do what they're doing, you know? I can't put on those heels, and I can't put on that face, and like, uh, so it's always like that, and if I do have any kind of critique, it comes from a place of like, if it is an acting challenge, you know, or if it's a presentational challenge or just projection or whatever, then I'm like, oh, I do that for a living every day. Here's what I would do different, you know, if you wanted my help or whatever. Um, so it's hard because yeah, I think there's two different uh, ways of approaching. Those are two different shows that they approach critique, you know. And so uh, with uh, the artistry on the Boulay Brothers show, uh, it's more subjective because art is subjective, you know. And with uh, the other show, it's kind of like a little bit sharp, you know, just like you, can, you sense it. But also remember at the end of the day, they're making television. And sometimes to make television, people on purposely just do a little bit of a poke where there doesn't need to be a poke. So remember a lot of the stuff you see, especially in reality TV, uh, take it with a grain of salt. It's entertainment and people, I mean, I'm always surprised to be like, ooh, they did her wrong, you know? And it's like, look, I'm gonna break it down to you. Half of the time, they already know who they want to make it to the final. Half of the time, they know who they want to be their winner and their new queen. Half of the time, they want to keep the bad apple as long as they can, because the bad apple makes those ratings go up. And that's the reality of reality TV. You never see the good ones, you know, uh, last way to the end, or the good the good acting, you know, or civil and quiet and polite to everyone. They don't go really far in these competitions because it's not entertaining to the audience. The audience is like, ooh, did you see how she looked at her? I can't wait. She hates her. Ah, I know. And they want to see this, like, combativeness, you know? And if someone's like, I just want everyone to be happy. Oh, you got, you're going home. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, what? But don't worry, we're going to give you Miss Congeniality, you know? And they'll give Miss Congeniality because they were so nice. We never forgot how nice you were, okay, nah. You know, they don't want that. They want, like, the person who makes the drama because it makes for good TV, unfortunate. And I'm a sucker for it, too, you know? I watch, like, The Housewives because the good housewives who are, like, polite and nice and do charity work but don't cause drama disappear after one season. They're like, the real housewives and no problems in a, a stable home. They're like, oh, no, we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I cut her, and what? <laughs> Watch out, or I'll sleep with your dad. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> this is insanity. Turn it up. You know? It's like, <laughs> That's why you watch these shows. Uh, and I'm guilty of it, because I do scripted for so long, you know, it's my career, that for my escape is not watching other scripted, is watching the ridiculousness of reality. It's addicting, because it's so insane to me, you know? Yeah, I ran those kids over, and what? It's like, what? You're going to jail. Yeah, I'm going to jail. It's like this insanity of like, there's people going to prison for embezzlement, you know, it's just like, it's a lot. And um, what was the question, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> thank you. That's good. Thank you. Hey, well, don't forget that. Don't forget candy. Don't forget that. There you go. Oh, your okay. candy. We are, we are just about out of time, so I'm afraid this will have to be our last question. Our apologies to everybody in line. What's your name, boss? Uh, Gilbert. Gilbert, what do you want to know? Um, so I do improv as well. Um, so I want to know what your favorite story or your favorite thing about improv is. My favorite story or fam oh, I think we have like six minutes. I think we have some time left. Do you want to? Sit? I'm looking at the thing here. You have two is questions. That, well, like, I, well, I gotta, oh, we gotta do the picture. Oh, god, I got it, got it, got it. I was like, oh, I feel bad. Sorry, guys. Um, improv. My favorite story of improv. Mm. I guess it was an improv, but we're doing a scene in my musical theater class, and it was a scripted like scene with like a song, and I think it was called like on the other side of the tracks, and it was a student who was wearing pearls and like was like longing for this life of like being, uh, uh, you know, rich and on the other side of the tracks, not living in poverty and blah blah. And they were singing, and they're like on the other side, and they're just like in the moment. It's, we're like freshmen in college, on the other side, of the, and then she like reached out to like do a grand gesture, and she was wearing pearls. She said, other side of the track, and then the pearls went. Poof. And they just fell all over everywhere, and we were all like, and then it was the middle of the show, so we were, or the middle of the representation, so we didn't know we could laugh, and so it was kind of like a, <laughs> and then no one wanted to clap, because like it was the end of the number, but it was like, do we clap? Are we clapping for the pearls? Are we clapping for, and then so, so people were like, <clears throat> and the piano player was all, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Close. And we were just like, it's like a, a cop, and it was just like this moment of like live theater. You can't beat it, you know? It's the best. So I didn't really not improv, but a, a live theater uh, performance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Give it up. Give it up. Those were good questions. <laughs>